deny that we're actually live. Oh, good. Okay, I got somebody laughing. So, yeah, that's completely... Uh... Oh, now the banner shows up. <laughs> okay. oh. <laughs> yeah, I've done this before. This isn't my first time. Um, oh, there's a delay. <laughs> oh, there is. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me know when you want me to share my screen and I'll, I'll, I'll start. Okay. Yeah, everybody's going, yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, there's like a there's like a delay. This is awesome. So I'm sitting here looking wow. at myself in the past. Randy, in the past, don't push the buttons. Uh... <laughs> oh, there's a 15-second delay. So if you want to go ahead and share your uh, screen. Okay, I'll do that. Because yeah, we're at 7 o'clock. Man, I'm looking at past self. Man, I was so much handsomer 15 seconds ago. Everything was so much better. Uh, okay, let me add you to the stream. There we go. And okay, let's prepare my talk. Lady, let's see. Are we at 701? We're going to do it. So. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, people of the world, um, oh, they are live. If you need, you can put a banner on. Eh, I'm not doing that. Um, so we've got Norman Baker uh, speaking this morning, 7 a.m., and he's going to do a deep dive with Tile DB and Sonar. Um, uh, Norman is the VP of Geospatial at TileDB. Uh, prior to joining TileDB, Norman focused on spatial indexing and image processing, uh, held engineering positions at uh, Cloudant, IBM, and Mapbox. Uh, he has a master's degree in mathematics from the University of Durham, England. So I'm going to hand this off to Norman, and I will see you good people in about 20 or so minutes. Uh, Norman, have fun. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks for a nice introduction. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about TileDB, which is an open source uh, embedded universal database, and also the work we've been doing with Sona. Um, during this presentation, if you want to tweet along, please do, and tag TileDB and tag FOSPG. So the objective of this talk is to understand that Sona is just as interesting as LIDAR. It's just another point cloud format. I want you to get a basic understanding of what TileDB embedded is. And um, we're also going to demonstrate slicing and sparse array directly from the cloud. And I want your takeaway to be, and I hope you agree, there are just too many formats in Sona, so use TileDB. So I thought it would be fun. It's FOSPG. Let's do a DIY Sona survey experiment. And my goal was to find a relatively inexpensive fish finder that would measure depth and temperature. I already had a small rowing boat. And then I wanted to write a Python script to connect to the device over UDP. And then, you know, it's good to go and do some exercise. So I thought, let's go for a array, we'll collect some data and review that as a TileDB array. I just want to make a note that this was just for fun. You know, a full CMR survey requires a very large team and very sophisticated equipment. So how do we do it? Well, this is the bed. It's the sync node. It's not going to sync. It's uh, made of metal. It's full of polystyrene and it will float even upside down, I imagine. And here's the beautiful Lake Leota, which is here in Wisconsin. It's a former mill pond from the 1800s, and it was dredged about 15 years ago. So I had a reference for the depth, and I wanted to make sure that I was getting the right results. This is the boat, which I still call fitted out. I'm using a, a fish finder here from Deeper, but you can also get them from Garmin and other places. As I say, they're relatively inexpensive. I'm hanging it off the stern of the boat here, and you can see I was just about to push it out to go for a raid. Here are the onboard electronics, which is just actually my laptop. Um, I'm connecting directly over UDP to the fish finder there. And here is the client. It's just a socket client. So I connect, I receive a stream of NMEA messages, and I print them out, and then I read them into a TileDB array. One of the things I, I, I learned when I was rowing around is that um, you don't want to be logging the exceptions because you, you have to stop rowing, you have to restart the client. So 
I just did a try it, set, pass, and finally on that code there. And now I'm going to jump into a couple of live demos with Lake Data. Just in case they don't work, I've actually captured the images here, but let's come out to presentation and we're going to jump into TowerDB Cloud. I'm going to show you a few hosted notebooks. Um, you can run all of these locally. I'm going to show you the results and then we're going to dig into what is TowerDB embedded. So here's the array schema for the Lake Data um, data set that I collected from the boat. You can see it has dimensions of longitude and latitude. And then I have attributes of depth and temperature. So TileDB is a multidimensional array. So we have multiple attributes, multiple dimensions, and we can compress them arbitrarily. So here I'm using a C standard. So here's the actual notebook. Let's run it live now. Okay, so that just ran now. So my actual data state is stored on S3 in this case, uh, it's called Lake Data. I'm gonna open the array, I'm gonna print the schema. So we, here we can see the dimensions of longitude and latitude. And we have uh, the attributes of depth and temperature. So that little device I showed you in the picture is measuring depth and also in temperature. I've opened the array, I've pulled back all the data. I'm gonna look at it as a data frame now, a pandas data frame. You can see I have about 5,000 rows and four columns, longitude, latitude, depth, and temperature. The actual depth was in meters in this case, uh, three and a half meters. So that's about what, 12 feet. Um, so there's been a bit of sediment build up in the last 15 years. And the temperature was about 24 degrees. What I did find is that the device was, was very good. It was reporting several reads per second, but it was offset quite a lot. So I corrected the data frame here both on longitude and latitude. I shifted it along to where I knew where the, uh, the slipway was. Then I printed it on a map using Folium. You can see that map just here. So you can see all my tracks. And then we're going to plot this um, here in Matplotlib. And you can see here is where I started and this is where the depth gets deeper and deeper. So the lake actually gets deep very, very quickly. And then we also import this into uh, Babylon.js here, and you can see the profile. Going back to the presentation a little bit now. So what is TileDB embedded? That's a library you use to go and capture this data, and the li library just used to go and analyze the array. It's an open source embeddable C++ library that stores and accesses multiple multi-dimensional arrays. It implements very fast array slicing across dimensions. And we support both dense and sparse arrays, and we have integrations in GDAL and Restereo and Poodle and many others. I want to show you a little bit here some of the features. Um, there are uh, API integrations into Python as well, R, C, C++, and, and a few others too. So let's try to be embedded at a glance. It, it's building C++. It's fully parallelized. It's a columnar format. So you, you are seeing there I had attributes of uh, temperature and depth. I can just retrieve either one of those. I don't have to retrieve them all at once. We support multiple compressors. So RLE, C standard, bzip2, quite a few others as well. And we use our trees for sparse arrays for very fast indexing and access. Um, we allow you to do parallel read and, write, read and write. So if you had lots and lots of sonar files or lots of LAC files, you can ingest them all at once into a single array. We support time traveling and schema evolution. I'll give you a quick demo of that. So here's a uh, time traveling example using a dense array. So every time you do a write, you're creating a fragment. So we have a write at T1 and we have a write at T2. Then if we just read at T1, we get that uh, array on the left. And if we read it from zero to T2, we get the, the 100, 200, 500, 600 on, in that array. And if we just read at T2 by itself, we just get that top left quadrant. And the same thing happens with sparse arrays. So again, write at T1, write at T2. And then when no dupes are allowed, you can see the result there on the left. And again, we're doing an interval slice there. And then when we just read at the final time, so T2, you can see we get the final result. So this is very useful when you want to do time traveling, when you, when you want to go back in time to see what's being written. So when I was creating that sonar array, for example, 
when I was writing the fragments, I could see what I was doing for like the first 10 minutes, the second 10 minutes, and so on. Okay, and when the dupes were allowed, when there were dupes, again, reading the final timestamp. So I want to jump into a, a few more demos, because I said I'll show you at scale. So I'm going to show you um, multi beam and also side scan sonar. And then I'm going to show you a demo over Lake Michigan. So that's at a very large scale. Okay, so it's going to jump out of this presentation and back into the notebook environment. So let's zoom in a little bit so it's a bit easier to read. There we go. So I'm going to walk you through a demo here of querying both multi-beam and side scan sonar. So this is more like the commercial uh, sonar data sets that you'd have. We actually created both of these tiles of arrays using our integration into Poodle and Poodle's integration into MB system. We're going to discuss a little bit of tooling that's available for sonar at the end of the presentation. Uh, MB system is one of the most common. So yes, multi-beam uh, side scan sonar is stored on S3. We're going to print the schema. It's a slightly different schema to the one we were looking at before, and that just shows you the flexibility of TileDB. We have dimensions of X, Y, and Z. And uh, this D type is 64 in this case. And then attributes of GPS time and amplitude. So you see they're getting the different attributes compared to the Lake DO2 example. We're going to print the schema. You can see the schema. And then TileDB allows you to print the non empty domain. You can see that on my cursor highlight just there. And the non empty domain is in native coordinates. So here you can see the extents in X, and Y, and Z. We'll continue by issuing a 3D query over the sample and counting the number of results. So here I'm going to slice on X and Y and Z. I'm going to print the keys. You can see them there. And we're querying directly from the cloud. We're going to plot this data and we're going to see the profile. So it's for multi beam. You can see a multi beam episode sample there. Going over X, you can see the depth. And again, we're going to put this into 3D. And you can see it's in Babylon JS. There we go, there's, there's the slice. Okay. And now I want to move on to the example of uh, Lake Michigan. I'm going to spend a bit of time on this because um, we've got about a good uh, six, seven minutes left until we hit 20 minutes. So I cut this example here. I'm going to show you the the data source. So this is the perimetry of Lake Michigan. Um, it's been gridded. It's a large data set. It's about 200 megabytes or so, which is not that not as large as TileDB can ha handle. TileDB can go up to petabyte level and above. This is just it's a relatively large for open source and free perimetry samples. We're going to show you how we did this ingest here. So for the ingest, um, we're going to use our integration into Pandas using TileDB Pi, which is open source. Um, you can see I copy um, my Michigan source data set. I'm actually going to read it as a CSV file. So this is an XYZ file, and the separator here is just spaces. You can see the column names there are X, Y, and Z. And there's a whole bunch of uh, NA values all around the shoreline, so I dropped all of those too. And here we have, what, what is that, 22 million rows and three columns over X, Y, and Z. We're going to create the schema. I'm going to apply compression to your schema. And I'm going to make it uh, have dimensions of X and Y and an attribute value for C, which is the depth. So I'm going to clean up any previous runs. And then I create the array like that. And I just call TileDB from Pandas. And I've read in that sonar data set. And I've written it out to a TileDB array with compression. So the result of that was that originally the file size was a 680 megabyte XYZ file, and now it's a 49 megabyte TileDB array that I can read as a sparse array directly from the cloud. So in terms of uh, doing um, renderings of um, SONAR data, I need to install the CM Motion um, library there, um, which is an integration for Map.lib. It provides all the pretty color maps. I'm going to open the array here. So I'm opening this array directly from S3. I'm going to print out the non empty domain. You can see the non empty domain here, which is um, a non empty latitude. I'm going to print out the schema. So X and Y. 
and then my depth C, and that's flight value two, which is a lot more reasonable. And I'm going to use the compression filter here, C standard level seven. And then that's great. So if I take the data and the other standard example, I retrieved all the data at once. This data is a little bit larger, so we're going to do a slice. So I'm slicing directly from the cloud. So I'm going to slice on X. I'm also going to slice on Y. I'm going to read these back as a data frame. Because depth is typically negative, I'm going to you know, change the data frame result to be minus one in this example. So here you can see I did a slice. So we had 22 million rows in the original data set. And now we have um, 1.4 million rows in the slice I just made. So I want to try and like calibrate this data. I want to make sure it's OK. So you know, I, I know from Google and Wikipedia, the maximum depth of Lake Michigan is 281 meters. So what is the actual max depth for this region? And we see it's about 173 meters. So within, we are within range. Our data processing went OK. And then going to plot, plot this using matplotlib. And you can see here a nice profile of the uh, sonar readings, the depth readings of Lake Michigan. I'm going to do the same thing here and put this into Babylon.js. So Babylon.js, as I was saying, is an open source 3D game engine from Microsoft. It's supported by Microsoft site. And you can see here the data and the depth. And we can rotate and spin that around. Also zoom in and out. It's a very nice data set. Um, going back to the presentation now. So I'll show you that demo. I'm going to talk a bit, a little bit about the available tooling. Um, so as I was saying, MP system is the most common for all the sonar formats. It's been around for a long time. We use uh, Poodle on top of MP system for a lot of the conversions. We have an open source driver in Poodle for Tower to be embedded. And we also have one for GDAR and REST area and all of the special tools you might use. And then you, you are seeing there that I was using um, our open source library there, Tower to be Pi. And I was ingesting data from XYZ and other formats. We found that we've written quite a few drivers directly now in Python because they're, they're pretty quick. Um, so we have drivers for XTF, S7K, and GSF. Um, there's been a whole bunch of work recently around uh, F7K. And there's a few libraries out there like uh, PyRead 7K that allow you to go and plot wedges. My big takeaway is that um, Tower to be embedded works really well for sonar and other point cloud formats. And, you know, I encourage you all to give it a go. It's very easy to go and slice your set data directly from the cloud and render it. And that's one of the most common operations you want to do. And then also when it's integrated into Pandas data frames, you can remove all the noise and do the cleanup that you need to do to go and make uh, very, very good renderings. Um, I'm going to um, open this presentation up for, for questions. Um, does anyone have any questions that they'd like to ask? So we had we had one question that said, could you go back over the notebook section with the code and man it and, and map at a higher zoom level? Uh, the, the, the code in the notebook was fairly small, but okay. we we I gave you full screen there at the end, so Okay. Uh, we've got a bit of time, we can do that if you want. Yeah, 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 yeah we've got plenty of time. Okay, let's let me show my scan again. I actually have a question too, but I will wait till that <laughs> Thanks, Randy. Okay. Okay. Yes, my, apolog my apologies. Let's zoom that in a little bit more. Okay, so let, let's uh, let's focus on the uh, Lake Leo two example. So it's the the sonar data sets that I captured um, using the bait, and you can see here's the URI, and that's actually a data set on S three. And then I'm showing that you open the array. You can print the schema. You see the schema is longitude and latitude, and then we multiple attributes of depth and temperature. And then the data frame here, you can see that we have about 5,000 rows, and you can see longitude, latitude, depth, and temperature. Uh, TowerDB is columnar, so you could just request uh, depth and temperature if you wanted to. And then I was showing here that the max, the depth, is 3.5 meters, so about 12 feet. And the temperature is about 24 degrees C, so pretty warm. We had a, an offset on the data. Uh, so I was just showing here that we were moving the data frame to 
to actually go and put the data set in the correct place. And I was doing a plot. You can see that the lake gets deep very, very quickly. And then I've shown that again in 3D. And then the, the more interesting one, I guess, was the whole Lake Michigan. So I think I zoomed in the notebook at that point, so it might be a bit bigger. And I was just showing here the same kind of thing, but at a bigger scale, that you open the Lake Michigan data set directly from S3. You print out the 90 domain, so that's the area you actually have data. And then because this data set's a lot bigger, we we're going to do a slice rather than retrieving the whole data set at once. So we slice the data frame in this case. And we'll kind of break the maximum depth to be less than 281 meters, and it was, it was about 173 meters. And then we do a plot. And then do the same thing again. It threw in that one just. Okay. And then in terms of the ingest, and again, I'm just going over this fairly quickly. We were using a pandas uh, read CSV because it was XYZ, so it was just space separated data set, reading it into a data frame, creating the schema, dimensions X and Y, and attribute Z, and then writing this array out directly to cloud storage. Okay. So th thanks everyone for your for your patience there. Uh, Randy, you said that you, you had a question? Yeah, well, actually, so someone's popped up with another question. Uh, was there was there no frequency access in any of that data? I don't quite understand the question, I'm sorry. I don't either. <laughs> uh, <laughs> apparently, it's something with the uh, sonar. But my question would be, what type of sonar unit did you take out in the boat? Um, I bought a device from a company called Deeper. Okay. Um, they have quite a, quite a few. They're relatively inexpensive. I wouldn't say they're cheap, but if you enjoy fishing, as I do, then I'm going to reuse it for fishing. Um, and I think Garmin also has quite a few other devices as well. Okay. Yeah, because my dad, my my uh, dad is a very avid fisherman, and he just bought a new uh, GPS unit. And I'm actually thinking, or a new sonar unit. Hey, maybe it's maybe maybe I need to do two things: go fishing and collect some data. <laughs> I, I, I quite like the uh, device from Deeper because it was uh, castable. So you can yeah. throw it out, throw it out on a line as well. So that was quite nice. Ah, cool. Awesome. Well, I guess that does anybody have any other questions out in the uh, out in the world? It seemed like everybody seemed to like it. So we're getting a lot of good comments from everybody. Um, cool. That was pretty cool. awesome. Great. Thanks, Andy. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining. Excellent. So. Um, We've got a few minutes left. Anybody has any other questions? I guess not. And I'll tell you what, the next talk is coming up. It's Christopher Arco. So hang loose for about another five minutes, and we'll uh, we'll be going with that one. Thank you, Bill. Cool. Okay. I can completely... Put up another banner.